2022 is going to be over before we know it, which means it's time to get your 2023 calendars ordered. What would you say if I told you that you could get a calendar with some of your favorite independent true crime podcasts, including Eel Crime? Pre-order your copy at podcastcalendars.com and get $5 off your order by using our promo code OLDCRIMERS. That's O-L-D-E-C-R-I-M-E-R-S. And if you order before November 30th, you can get an additional 10% off. That's podcastcalendars.com, code OLDCRIMERS. Don't miss your chance to spend May with us, and we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Ye Old Crime where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. How's it going? My house is a den of sickness. Samesies! If you hear coughs in the background of our audio, I apologize in advance. Me too. My youngest is getting over a case of the flu. She's had a cough for a while, and yeah. Yeah, we just got sick this weekend. Three of us in our house, and there's some coughing. Mm-hmm. Nothing, no fevers yet, though, so fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes or over on our link tree to get started today. Fun fact, today's topic is courtesy of our longtime listener, Kent. <gasps> Kent! Oh, hi, Kent. Kent and Carol listen, like, every week, like, on the day. So, mm-hmm. hi, good morning. I hope you guys are having a good morning and a good cup of coffee. Yeah, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I was going to say he and our <laughs> patron, Carol, have been listeners for, I think, as long as the show has been running. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ever since I told her about it. Yeah. And we appreciate their support very much. Very, very much. More than they think. And since we're shouting out patrons, I want to shout out our newest patron, Tom. Hi, Tom. <laughs> I think he did the review last week. I can't remember. Really? Yeah, I think his his was the puppy and wine review that I read. Oh, remember? that's so nice. And Tom is a super amazing person. He supports a lot of true crime podcasts in the indie community. Mm -hmm. And I might actually send him a puppy and some wine. So keep your your eyes on your mailbox, Tom, is all I'm going to say about that. I hope you like those animatronic puppies that yip and then do a backflip. Oh my god, can you imagine? (laughs) And they never quite land. They always like go on their side and they're like meh, 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 (laughs) meh. It's just like struggle. You need to get like C batteries for them. They don't take regular batteries. Oh, yeah. You know, they take like the weird brick looking ones. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Get two of those double D's. <laughs> <laughs> why is this puppy so heavy? It's the batteries. <laughs> that's the, that's the, why it can't flip. <laughs> that's why it's it too, just falls over. It's, it's too back heavy on like the right leg or something. It's too, it's too battery heavy. Too bad, <laughs> Move on with that. <laughs> my, my core is too thick. <laughs> that core is too fat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> is that a double D battery, or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> yep, 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 yep. <laughs> and she ooped. <laughs> All right. So, sorry for making it weird, Kent, but you you knew 
going in. Yep. That this was going to happen. Maybe we'll send Kent and Carol a puppy. There you go. <laughs> that's our new That's our new Patreon thing. You donate a certain amount of money and we'll give you a battery-operated dog with no batteries. Good luck finding them. <laughs> yep. It's just a corpse of an electronic dog. <laughs> Today, yes. we are going to be discussing Kaspar Hauser. Ooh. Okay, Kent. We're going to Germany. Oh yeah. All right. All right. I'll try and get my my German on. Your eighth grade, ninth grade German. <laughs> yep. Sorry, Frau Tonsfeld. Information was pulled from the following sources: a 2022 All That's Interesting article by Gina Demurl, a 2021 Ancient Origins article by Natalia Klimczak. 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 2020, The Public Domain Review article, 2015, Mental Floss article by Stacey Conrad, 2014, EduBlocks Online Tutor article by Susan Duplessis, 2014, Live Science article by Benjamin Radford, 2011, The Guardian article by Simon Winder, Britannica, and Wikipedia. Nice. And links to all these articles will be included in the show notes. And I did not put the phonetic spelling of his name anywhere in my notes. So I'm going to try and remember every single time. <laughs> Good luck, self. <laughs> Let's turn into a drinking game every time I say his name wrong. Have at it. Yeah. Hopefully it'll only be a couple times. <laughs> I apologize in advance if you get alcohol poisoning. If it's shots of espresso, maybe. May you not have a heart condition. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Kaspar Hauser was born on April 30th, 1812 in Germany. Although the name of his mother and father, not to mention the location of his birth, is unknown. Hmm. They just ceased. The, everything ceased to exist after he was born. He just blipped into existence. Yeah. It's, it's it's the reverse Thanos snap. You just like <laughs> blipped into existence. It's like 1812. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. What we do know is that his father, who was a cavalryman of the 6th Regiment, was apparently dead. Oh, oh that was too soon. That was it. <laughs> mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> he blipped into existence and his dad died instantly. Yep. <laughs> And his mother, for one reason or another, was unable to care for him. Maybe she got blipped, too. Maybe she did. It was all Thanos. This they got just... real blipped, and he blipped in place of them. Yeah. He was the replacement blip. Yeah, he's the power of two. Christ compels you. Anyway. <laughs> On May 26th, 1828, 16-year-old Kaspar was found in Nuremberg, Germany, wearing tattered clothes that consisted of pantaloons, a waistcoat, silk necktie, a gray jacket, boots so battered that his feet hung out of them, and a handkerchief bearing the initials K.H. So, like, there's no word of him until he just shows up at 16 after being born? Yep. Yeah, this is totally a Thanos blip thing. <laughs> Marvel is the only... <laughs> Sound reasoning behind this. Yep. He had two letters in his possession and was looking for Captain von Wiesnick, who was the captain of the 4th Squadron of the 6th Cavalry Regiment. One letter was sent, quote, from the Bavarian border, the unnamed place, 1828, end quote. Dang. Okay. I don't know what the unnamed place is. This sounds like some Hydra bullshit. You it know does. What I mean? it I'm does. waiting for like Red Skull to show up. He's a super soldier. And be like, I'm his father. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I was already on that alien planet. I could never get the soul stone. <laughs> <laughs> so I made a soul from two people. <laughs> and then just made him 16 years old. <laughs> And I he somehow from, blipped back with him. He went from baby <laughs> to 16. <laughs> you know, just blip it. That's what they say, as the kids say. The first of the letters was addressed to Captain von Wiesnig, 
from an anonymous laborer who stated that he had raised Kaspar since he was around four months old, but he was no longer able to provide for him, and he hoped that the captain would provide for him instead. Okay. That's really strange. Like, Mm -hmm. I've heard of you. Will you take care of this child that I found on the street? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. By the way, you don't need to know me. Yeah, you don't need to know me. No. The caretaker apparently took over Kaspar's care on October 7th, 1812. And although he wasn't related to Kaspar by blood, he raised him as his own son and a good Christian, as well as taught him how to read and write. But apparently not how to keep his clothes nice. Apparently not. (laughs) How to wear shoes. (laughs) (laughs) Cut them open. (laughs) slide your foot in walk the other letter which appeared to have been written by the boy's mother and was dated back to 1812 noted that caspar's father was no longer living that she was unable to provide for him and that she was sending him in the hopes of joining the military okay so she wanted his life to be just like his dad's i wonder if she was like well, if he's part of this thing, then I know he'll be taken care of, right? I suppose. Yeah. That, I mean, one of the reasons of joining the military is knowing that you have a place to sleep, mm-hmm. a meal to eat, consistency. Mm-hmm. I think I mean, that was part it's of a it. Lot of, it's a lot of security that people don't really think about until they think about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. The letters noted that his caretaker was unable to deliver him to Nuremberg himself, as it would, quote, cost me my neck, end quote. And so a shoemaker named Weichmann, who had discovered Kaspar wandering around the town square, escorted him to the home of the captain. Did he give him shoes? Did he oh see his God. shoes as a shoemaker and was like, listen. I hope he did. You need to come to my house. My God. <laughs> Actually, the, the anonymous laborer was a bear who had no <laughs> him. Before it was just, it was just like a swarm of moths, just like eating at his clothes. (laughs) He was just followed by moths (laughs) after after Brother Bear told him to leave home. Yep. The whole time that he was there, he would repeatedly say, "quote I want to be a cavalryman as my father was," end quote, or "horse, horse," or "don't know." He was definitely raised by a bear. That's why he was an anonymous laborer. The bear worked for a circus, and that's how they met. When questioned further, he noted that prior to appearing in Nuremberg, he hadn't, quote, gone a step from the house in order that nobody might know where he was brought up, end quote, as he was never allowed to go into his guardian's home. The captain took the boy to the police, as it stated in the letter that the captain could decide to welcome him to the cavalry or, quote, hang him in the chimney, end quote. Wow. This is a guy who's like, I raised him as my own son, and then I maimed him like an animal and sent him to you. Take him or kill him. (laughs) I don't care. (laughs) Matters not to me. Not my problem. Here are moths. (laughs) I sent along a swarm of moths to keep him safe on his journey. Hopefully the letters are intact. XOXO, Gossip Girl. (laughs) (laughs) While at the police station, it was observed that Caspar behaved very much like a toddler learning to walk for the first time. Almost as if he had never worn shoes before. That would make sense as to why he didn't know how to take care of his shoes. Yeah. Does this shoe survive a knife? No. No, it does not. (laughs) Can you fix it with the knife? No. No. You cannot. (laughs) You cannot stab it back together again. It does not work that way. (laughs) Regardless, all agreed that he was not an idiot or insane. So there's that. He's just just a boy raised by a bear. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the old Nuremberg bear boy, (laughs) as we like to say. (laughs) <laughs> there's just a cave it says B&B but that's not what they think it is that's not a bed and breakfast <laughs> the 
bear and his boy. Kaspar spent the first two months that he was in Nuremberg in the town prison for vagrancy. Although late in his teens, the mayor observed that although the letters stated he could read and write, he appeared illiterate and could only write his name. When asked about his life prior to appearing in Nuremberg, Kaspar stated that he didn't know anything other than his name, and when he was provided with food, he preferred bread and water to more nutritional fare, like meat and vegetables, and he exhibited a severe lack of manners. So I read in multiple places that people would try to feed him, like, meat and potatoes, right? Yeah. And he would get sick. Like, he would throw it up. So the only thing that he could eat was bread and water. Weird. Right? Additionally, he was fascinated by his reflection when he was provided with a mirror. And he kept, like, looking behind himself because he was trying to figure out where the person was. was his own reflection? Yeah, he didn't know. Oh, he was a big boy. And when he was given a lit candle, he gazed upon it in sheer wonder, even going so far as to burn his hand when he attempted to grab the flame. Many townspeople thought that perhaps he had been abandoned in the woods and raised himself as a feral child. But if that was the case, where did he get the clothes? From the circus bear. <laughs> the bear ate someone and gave him the clothes, and that's why they're all tattered. Because he had to murder the guy first. There you go. I solved it. You're welcome. You, you solved it. <laughs> you solved the first of the, the seven mysteries. Yeah. Despite the fact that Caspar had been wearing boots that exposed his feet, damaging them during his journey... They were, quote, as soft as the palm of a hand, end quote, and gave the impression, right, that prior to arriving at Nuremberg, he had never actually worn shoes before. Bear. Bear boy. He spent two months in Lugensland Tower in Nuremberg Castle with a jailer named Andreas Hiltel. While he was there, Andreas noted that Kaspar appeared to be in relatively good health, all things considered, and that he was able to pick things up very quickly. Andreas's son Julius played with Kaspar and was able to teach him to speak better during his stay with them. That's good. I mean, mm-hmm. it's nice that there was a jailer that actually cared. Yeah. Kaspar was visited regularly by the mayor, Mayor Binder, who claimed that he seemed to learn very quickly and had a good memory. Caspar was eventually placed into the care of Lord Stanhope, a British nobleman, after he was made a ward of the city. While in his care, Caspar made a miraculous transformation, learning how to read and write, communicate more effectively, and the following year, in 1829, he even published an autobiography, noting that up until he had met the captain, he had lived his entire life in a six-foot-long, three-foot-wide, three-and-a-half-foot-high dark cell, with his only human interaction taking place when he would be fed bread and water by strangers he never actually saw. That's horrifying. Also, that's not the first time I've heard something like this happen in Germany. What is wrong with Germany? (laughs) Bears. (laughs) This has happened (laughs) more than once in Germany. Kaspar's only comfort was a bed of straw that he slept on and a wool blanket. Occasionally, when drinking the water he was provided, he stated it tasted bitter and would always put him to sleep. He would then wake up the following day clean, in a new change of clothes, with fresh straw bedding, and his hair and nails would be cut. He also shared that he had three wooden toys, two horses, and a dog. I'm kind of mad at his mom, because I feel like she would have done a much better job than this horror show, even in her worst case. Yeah, it's hard to know anything about her. Yeah, because, I mean, you never know. Yeah. People people don't usually make those decisions lightly, but... Yeah. I wonder what she'd say if she knew that that was... The alternative. Yeah. Well, like we have zero idea who she could be. Mm-hmm. So there's any number of scenarios on what her circumstances were. 
Mm-hmm. Cass Potter went, in, went on to describe in detail a dream he had where he was in a large castle with a woman dressed very elegantly and a, a swordsman dressed all in black. Lord Stanhope theorized that it was perhaps a memory from his life prior to being placed in his prison. Meh. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. They've had him for four, like ever since he was four months old. I find that difficult to believe. Yeah. From Lord Stanhope, Caspar was once again moved, this time to the care of a professor and schoolmaster named Friedrich Delmar. While there, the professor worked with him on a variety of subjects, including reading and writing, and learned that Caspar had a knack for drawing. Before long, Caspar became a bit of a celebrity. Hundreds of articles, plays, and eventually books and films were made about him over the years. For example, in an issue of Overland Monthly and Out West magazine from November 1874, it stated, quote, One of the strangest stories of the century is that of Kaspar Hauser. For a quarter of a century, it is doubtful if any single individual in all Europe was so much discussed or awoke so great an interest and curiosity. The newspapers on both sides of the ocean were full of him. Pamphlets and books were printed to sustain this or that theory of his birth and belongings. Philanthropers, philosophers, <laughs> and s- savants were aroused on his behalf, end quote. Philanthropers, I don't think that's really a word. That's not a word, but that's that was the quotation. But that was in there, so I left it. Philanthropers? Philanthropers? Yeah, people who are philanthropic yeah. in nature. I don't know. Yeah. It just sounds too close to philanderers. So it does. Like, philanderers were very interested in his case. <laughs> philanthropic philanderers. So nice, but so naughty. <laughs> <laughs> too generous. In more ways than one. Wink. <laughs> In a bit of a strange twist in this already bizarre tale, a number of assassination attempts were made against Kaspar, with the last one taking place five years after his fateful discovery in Nuremberg. Weird. In December 1831, Kaspar moved to Ansbach and was placed in the care of Johann Jörg, I'm going to say Jörg Mayer. Johann was a strict schoolmaster and instantly disliked Kaspar, believing him to be a habitual liar. Awesome. What a great start to a relationship. Right? I hate you. Welcome to my home. I hate you because I'm pretty sure you lie all the time. Yep. During his time in Ansbach, Kaspar became a clerk in the office of the President of the Court of Appeal, Anselm Ritter von Feuerbach. Anselm went on to write a book about Kaspar Hauser, And here is an excerpt regarding Kaspar's love of art. This is kind of long. Quote, One of his favorite pursuits next to writing was drawing, for which he shewed as much capacity as perseverance. During several days, he had proposed to himself the task of copying a lithographic portrait of the Burgomaster Binder, which is the mayor. A large bundle of quarto sheets was entirely filled with these copies, which, in proportion as they were finished, were piled in long succession upon each other. I looked over them and found that the first attempts were exactly like those of little children who think that they have drawn a face, when they have scrawled on a paper a figure intended to represent an oval, and in it a pair of round holes, with a few perpendicular and cross scratches. But in almost every one of the following attempts, some progress was visible, so that these strokes gradually became more similar to a human countenance, and at last represented the original imperfectly and coarsely, but still in such a manner that the resemblance could be recognized. I expressed to him my approbation of, of, his, la- of his last attempts, but he did not appear satisfied with them, and gave me to understand that he must still make many copies before one of them was quite like, and he would then give it to Burgomaster. Another quote, this one's kind of gross, is, Kaspar's room was small, but clean and light, and from the window was seen an agreeable and extensive landscape. 
We found him barefooted, wearing only a shirt and a pair of old pantaloons. The sides of the room, as high as they could be reached, were adorned by him with colored prints, which he had received as presents from his numerous visitors. Every morning they were fixed by him anew on the walls with his saliva, which was then (laughs) adhesive like glue. Because that's probably the only way he knew how to do it. Yep. And they were removed by him as soon as it was dusk and laid together near him. There's this parenthetical that says, This saliva was so much like glue that in removing the prints, pieces of them remained sticking to the walls or fragments of the plaster adhered to the prints. End quote. Really not drinking much of that water, huh? <laughs> no. My God. I've never been told my saliva is like glue, so. I have not, so. Can't relate. I must be properly hydrated. Yeah. On December 14th, 1833, Kaspar was stabbed in the chest on his left breast at the Ansbach oh. Court Garden while visiting Lord Stanhope. He passed away at the age of 21 three days later on December 17th. Oh. He was buried in Ansbach in the Stadtfriedhof or city cemetery, and his grave is marked by a headstone written in Latin. The inscription reads, quote, Here lies Kaspar Hauser, riddle of his time. His birth was unknown, his death mysterious. 1833. End quote. A monument was later erected in the court garden, also in Latin, with the translated inscription reading, quote, Here lies a mysterious one who was killed in a mysterious manner. End quote. Following his untimely death, and even during his admittedly short life, there were a number of theories on who he actually was and who his parents were. One theory states that he was in fact the son of Grand Duke Charles von Baden and Stephanie de Bauharnier, who was the adopted daughter of Napoleon Bonaparte. That's wild. Was was this adopted daughter also a part of a cult (laughs) that made kids grow in boxes in the woods? This theory started in 1829. According to history, the Prince of Baden was born on September 29th, 1812, and officially died on October 16th, 1812. However, there are some that believe he had been kidnapped as an infant in order to keep the junior branch of the Baden house alive. This is important because Charles didn't have any surviving male heirs, so his successor became his uncle Louis, who was later succeeded by Leopold, his Mm half-brother. The reason this theory was so popular was because it would explain why he had been so mistreated during his childhood and makes sense as to why he had so many attempts made on his life prior to the final one that successfully ended it. In 1876, a man named Otto Mitterstadt was able to provide evidence that disproved this theory. He found official documents that noted the details of the infant prince's emergency baptism, his autopsy, and subsequent burial. Mm. He also noted that the Grand Duchess was very ill at the time of his birth and wasn't even able to see her dead son in 1812. Aww, that's devastating. The only people who were allowed to see the dead prince were his father, the Grand Duke, his grandmother, aunt, and ten court physicians and nurses. Official letters belonging to the Grand Duke's mother were published in 1951, that provided further details regarding the birth, illness, and death of the Prince of Baden, which put an end to the rumors that Kaspar was, in fact, royalty. Some believe that Kaspar suffered from an undiagnosed case of epilepsy, and that a number of his visions and claims were as a result of this condition. Still others believe that as a result of the neglect and abuse he purportedly suffered from, that he had simply become delusional and a bit mad. Mm. There are more theories around his true origins, but one thing was very clear about him. He was a habitual liar. Oh. We're going to go into it. 
The story about his life being locked in a dark cell-like room was easily disproven due to his physique. If he had spent the first 16 years of his life in such conditions, he would have been severely malnourished and his body would have suffered from a variety of maladies. Mm -hmm. He would have likely suffered from the bone-softening disease rickets, and there was no mention whatsoever of him having any sort of physical deformities that would back up these claims. Okay. Because, I mean, you need vitamin D. And yep. Being in a box is not going to get that for you. Yeah. Like, he would have had, like, a curved spine, probably. He would have been hunched over. Nothing. Interesting. Okay. The letter that was supposedly written by his mother back in 1812 was a forgery, as Captain von Weissnig wasn't even stationed in Nuremberg at the time, and wouldn't be until he encountered Kaspar in 1828. Both letters appear to be written by the same person, and it's believed that Kaspar wrote both of them himself. Okay. There are many who also believe that he faked the attempts made on his life as well and may, in fact, have suffered from a form of Munchausen syndrome. Kaspar noted three attempts on his life, and I'll go into each of them. Until the fourth one that succeeded. The third one succeeded. Mm, Okay. On October 17th, 1829, at the age of 17, he was attacked in the professor's cellar by a cloaked figure while he was using the privy. Not attacked okay. while on the toilet. That sucks. Yeah. That's everyone's fear. The attack resulted in him suffering a cut on his forehead that left a scar. He claimed that the mysterious attacker had stated, quote, you still have to die ere you leave the city of Nuremberg, end quote. He shared that he recognized the voice as that of the man that brought him to the city. Okay. But nothing was ever found. The second attempt was made again when he was alone in his room while he was staying with the the Biberbach family on April 3rd, 1830, where he was shot on the right side of his head. Oh. He would later go on to admit that he had, in fact, shot himself in this instance. (laughs) Was it his first time using a gun, or did he try to complete? I don't know. I don't know if it was like an accident an accidental shot and then he was embarrassed and was like oh I was attacked who knows the third and final attempt took place on December 14th 1833 when he was alone in the public gardens and he was fatally stabbed in the chest by an assailant that he was unable to describe Mm. Kaspar's death however is suspicious His claims about being attacked are heavily contradicted, mainly because all of the evidence that was found wasn't anywhere near the scene of the supposed attack. A violet purse was discovered that Kaspar claimed was given to him by his attacker, a purse that, ironically, had a note inside that included the name of where the attacker lived. Oh, that's very convenient. Here, Mm -hmm. here's here's Mm -hmm. my address. I'm going to kill you now. Another bit of interesting evidence was a second set of footprints in the snow. Many believe that Kaspar, like the attempts made in the past, had in fact attacked himself and unintentionally injured himself worse than intended. Mm. At the time, he had come into the home of Lord Stanhope, babbling almost incoherently about how he'd been lured into the park by a stranger who proceeded to stab him. During his attempt to show his friends where the attack had happened, he collapsed halfway through the journey and three days later died from his wounds. Hmm. During the police investigation, the letter inside the purse was examined, and it was written in a mirror writing style in German. Translated, the letter reads as follows, quote, Hause will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look, and from where I am. To save Hausa the effort, I want to tell you myself from where I come. And then there's a blank. Mm -hmm. I come from, from, blank, the Bavarian border, blank, on the river, blank, 
I will even tell you the name. M-L-O. End quote. Okay. Considering all the facts about his life were provided by Kaspar himself, it's impossible to know if anything he said was true. Yeah. With no relatives coming forward to back up or contradict his claims, the mystery of who he actually was may never be answered. The only truth we can take away from his strange life is the fact that he desperately wanted to be famous. Oh. And that may be the only verifiable thing about the man known as Kaspar or Hausa. And just in case there are any doubts, DNA testing was conducted in 1998 using a sample of blood from the shirt he was wearing when he was stabbed and blood samples from two of the living descendants, Stephanie de Bahonier, but alas, it seems that he is not the missing Prince of Baden. There you go. One mystery solved. Mm -hmm. And that's all we know about Kaspar Hauser. Crazy. To get ancestry DNA, that, that blood. There you go. Or the thick saliva <laughs> on that wall. On that public domain website that I listed, they included a lot of photos and like illustrations that he had done. He okay. actually was really good. Like yeah. you, you can see how it like progressed. Yeah, it was cool. There are a couple self portraits that he did, and one of them is very much like something a kid would do, and then the other mm -hmm. one is like much better. And he even did an illustration of what I'm assuming is the house that he had supposedly escaped from. Or whatever. Okay. So I'll include all those on social media, but interesting. it's interesting. If you're interested in ad free content, consider supporting us with a one time donation either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. If you'd like early ad free content, not to mention some bonus material, become a member of our Patreon today for as low as a dollar a month. Hey, I'm Courtney. And I'm Amanda. And this is a nefarious nightmare. We cover true crime and the paranormal. We raise awareness about the senseless acts committed against victims. We won't go easy on the offenders, but show serious empathy to the victims. And sometimes we dive into some weird topics outside of true crime, like the paranormal or even conspiracy theories. Our listeners are definitely the best, and we are their biggest fans. So join us. Come on in. All are welcome. Let's dive into these cases. You can find us on any podcast platform and on YouTube. Be sure to find us, hit subscribe, and share us with your friends. We do have great life advice, such as don't be a Richard. Yes, <laughs> and wear deodorant. We don't want to smell you. But all are welcome to a nefarious nightmare. And this week's podcast plug is A Nefarious Nightmare. Best friends Amanda and Courtney deep dive into true crime cases with an empathetic standpoint. They focus awareness mainly on lesser known crimes and crimes against those deemed extra vulnerable. Occasionally, the hosts will cover more well-known cases due to relevance or a particularly fascinating element. And we will have a link to their show in the show notes. Thanks. So what is something good you'd like to share? Aside from being sick, we started out having a very nice weekend. My fiancé's grandfather got married after 37 years of being together. And so we got to experience that wedding, and it was a privilege to go see. And it was nice to see everybody, and his, his daughter gets along really well with her cousins. And so it was really fun to kind of see her hang out with cousins, and it was very normal feeling and strange, you know? Mm -hmm. Because two years of not really doing much of that to, like, getting exposed to it was pretty crazy, but it was nice. Nice. It snowed, so it, Willie, my service dog, loves snow. Snow is probably, aside from, like, spiky, squeaky balls, snow is probably, like, his one of the top five fa favorite things of all time for him. Mm-hmm. So it snowed before I had to give him a bath. So I let him like 
bathe in it and like slide down the hill and do everything he wanted in the snow. And then I gave him a bath. He thoroughly enjoyed himself with the very little bit of snow that stuck to the ground. And that's always one of my favorite things because he's just so cute. He's just like puppy again every time he interacts with the snow. Nice. What about you? What's one good thing? I had a busy week this week. I did a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Met up with my book club ladies and we picked out a new book. Nice. We're reading Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. Okay. Which I have not read before, but I'm like drawn in. Nice. Because it's it's like historical stuff. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. I am there. <laughs> and watched the second Enola Holmes movie. Awesome. Which I thought was cool that they covered a real thing that I will later cover on the show about the Matchstick Girls. Awesome. So stay tuned for that. Right. Shall we? Shall we? Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Facebook and Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. On TikTok? Of course you are. Follow us at yieldcrimepodcast. A great way to support the show if you want to help us out but can't do so financially is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, and anywhere you listen to podcasts and can leave ratings. Mm -hmm. This week's comes from Podchaser, from our amazing friend, John, from Reddit on Wiki. Nice. And he says, Yield Crime is just one of those shows that the moment you hit the play button, you get sucked in this time vortex of awesomeness. The hosts are funny and witty and truly paints a picture to some crimes from yesteryear. (laughs) P.S. The cramp episodes are to die for, and it's an absolute blast. Check them out. Oh, thank you. That's that's so nice. I love you, John. You're one of my favorite people. (laughs) He and his wife recently adopted a new corgi named Kevin. Kevin's a good name for a dad. He's adorable. He's a little puppy. (laughs) Kevin! (laughs) (laughs) I keep wanting to tease him and say, like, just don't let him bring any chili into the office. Yeah. But I haven't made that joke. But now I did hear, so maybe he'll listen to it and hear it. (laughs) (laughs) Laugh, John, laugh. (laughs) Laugh at my joke. (laughs) If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, Click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. And in sticking with the theme of November, there's going to be another sale at our Tea Public shop, November 15th through the 20th. Get 35% off and stay tuned because later this month, there's going to be up to 40 percent off on some days nice. and maybe even more than that Exciting. keep your eyes peeled for that mm-hmm. and on that note as always i'm Lindsay, and i'm madison and we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime <laughs>